morning. We bring you our St. James Church service this morning from this beautiful location on Russell Lands, appropriately called Heaven Hill. Glad you're with us this morning. We're still going through some different times here. Um, as if things weren't rough enough with the pandemic we're in, we of course had this terrible storm come through town. Uh, there's been some of our parishioners suffer through this with loss of home and property, but, but everybody's okay. Nobody's been hurt physically, so I guess, you know, thank God we're doing all right. Um, it's going to be a little while yet before we're done with this whole new kind of way of doing church. The bishop has said uh, at least until uh, through the Sunday of March, May, I'm sorry, May 17th, which would take us into the Sunday of May 24th at the earliest. And even then, we don't know exactly what this will look like. But uh, who knows, maybe with a little luck, the bishop who's scheduled to be with us on the first Sunday in June, perhaps that'll be our first Sunday back together, and we'll celebrate it with the bishop, and uh, wouldn't that be grand? So if you have any troubles out there, please just remember to let us know. Let us know at the church. Uh, we can help. We have resources. We're here for you. We're here for each other. Please check on each other eye on each other, call your friends, call your neighbors, call your fellow St. James family, and uh, keep in touch, make sure everybody's okay, and um, we'll just keep doing the best we can here until we can all be together again. May the Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 14a, 36 through 41. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from the corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 116, verses 1 through 6 and 10 through 17. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. Cords of death entangled me. The grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray you save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. I, Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all the people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, hallelujah. 
Our second reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience in the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have seen and been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, but how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astonished us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scripture. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we were talking to us on the, on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered there. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread gospel of the Lord. When I was
was a kid, we did not go to any formal churches. You know, homeschooling, we did home churching. There were several families that gathered together in various homes. We sat together and did a, a service that was kind of a amalgamation, if you will, of various uh, traditions. My wife jokingly refers to it as the Church of Fruit and Nuts. But it was good. I was steeped in Jesus and in taking communion, the Apostles' Creed. The sermons were short. Maybe that's where I picked up my length of sermon time. I don't know. I felt close to Jesus in those years. I was inspired to read scripture. I read my Bible, not because I was made to. I was encouraged to, but not because I wanted to. I read through the Bible and I learned what I could and so I got to be about 16 or 17 and really just didn't want to go anymore. I was into other things, didn't seem so important anymore. So I stopped going. We eventually stopped having church at home. I never went to any formal groups. I, I kept reading my Bible and I picked up literature here and there. I was particularly got curious and, and like to read books of archaeology, biblical archaeology, in Old Testament time. Well, I pretty much stayed just doing that, feeling kind of as people call it, spiritual. Well, that was all. Well into my 20s. Late in my 20s, uh, I met some folks who, while I was kind of getting this feeling I might want to start finding a church family, I... Uh, found these people who introduced me to the Episcopal Church in Gunnersville, Epiphany Church. The rector there was uh, Father Joe Sanderson, who eventually became my mentor. It was good. I enjoyed it there. I met Betsy uh, before that, but realized we were both going to the same church. Uh, we went to the same church together separately. I was an 8 o'clocker. She was a 10 o'clocker. Somehow we managed to make that work. It was good. Uh, I loved the Episcopal Church. I loved the liturgy. It was new to me. It was a little exciting. I liked the people there. We had a good social group there of uh, other couples about our age with children, that same situation we were in. Love Father Joe. Good guy. Great, great sermons from him. But as much as I liked it all, I didn't really feel all that close to Jesus. I like the setting, I like the church, I like the sermons, I, I like the people, but I didn't really feel like I knew Jesus, or I was excited to be a Christian, or, or there was really no burning in my heart about my faith. At some point, some friends of ours and I about something called Crucia. I'd heard a little bit about it. I'd heard that it was full of kind of freaky Episcopalians who weren't like the normal Episcopalians. It was kind of hard for me to imagine kind of evangelical Episcopalians. All the ones I had ever met were too prim and proper the services were too formal. Um, just didn't sound like the church that I was familiar with. But I was intrigued, as was Betsy. Eventually, uh, we agreed that we would go. I was a little apprehensive in, indeed, but, uh, but we decided to go. I, I had no idea what it was going to be like. I packed up a few things and a, a good thick novel to read. I'd heard about how boring these church retreats can be, so I went as prepared as I could be. Our friends took us there and came with our luggage. And when we got there, they pulled up to a door and pulled our luggage out and set it on the ground and said, OK, see you around. And they took off. It was a, it was a little unnerving. Actually, almost kind of a little creepy. 
as the people that came to greet us just seemed to like a little too happy, a little too smiley. I wasn't sure what we were getting ourselves into. Well, the weekend went by pretty quickly. We had a good time. We got in separate rooms, put in separate rooms with a roommate. That was kind of odd. Um, we sat at tables. We had discussions. There was music. Um, nice folks. We talked some. We had a little fun. Heard more music. Day by day went by for the few days there. Had more fun, sang more music, heard more talks. It all seemed pretty simple, really. But at the end, when it was all over, it had kind of just seemed like it was no real big deal. Until at the end, we sat together, we broke bread, drank wine. And I realized it was kind of like my walk on Emmaus. It's like these two strangers walking along in our gospel reading today. I realized that Jesus at some point had arrived at our Curcio. He'd been sitting right next to me, and I, I didn't even realize it until he was gone. Hard to explain. We had a lot of folks at our church that have been to Crucio. We have a lot of newer and older folks that have not been to Crucio. Crucio is a movement in the Diocese of Alabama, which has been strongly endorsed by all of our bishops for the last four bishops since its inception here in Alabama. not required of clergy to go, all clergy, but almost. Henry Parsley used to require it, but not all bishops have, but they strongly encourage. It's not just for freaky evangelical Episcopalians by any means. I was a carpenter contractor when I went. Folks that encouraged me to go were regular everyday folks. Now over 7,000 people in our diocese have gone. What I've come to find out is it was really one of the most powerful, revealing experiences I've had in learning how to walk with Jesus, how to recognize Jesus in my life, learning just how simple it is really. You know, I always thought it was, it was hard. I always thought it required a lot of hard work. Some people out there try to convince you that, that you have to be somebody very special, that you have to be very strict with yourself, that you have to be very pious, you have to be really uptight for Jesus to want to be a part of your life. But that's simply not the case. Quite the opposite, really. You have to let go of some of your inhibitions. You have to let go of those things that hold you back and become a little more childlike in your faith. You have to be willing to have a little fun with God. You know, let God have fun with you. These are some of the things that I learned in my Crucio experience. It was literally a life-changing chance for me. Should everybody go to Crucio? Probably not. Should most people go to Crucio? I think so. Does everybody have a phenomenal experience? No, they don't. Do a lot of people have a one-of-a-kind unique experience? Yes, they do. We're in some difficult times now, like I said at the beginning. We're separated, church is a little different. Some of us may be getting a little, feeling a little separated, alone at home. Some of us may be feeling a little separated from our church and those spiritual things that, that nurture us in our lives. 
We will get through this. We will get back together one day. What we do, if you have not been to Crisillo, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time for you to give that some thought. You can come to either Jan Young, who's our, we call her our lay rector for Crisillo at our church, or you can come and talk to me, I'll tell you anything you want to know about it. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity for me to learn a new way to let Jesus into my life and for me to be a part of, of something exciting in my faith that I've never experienced before. And it just might be the same thing for you. So, for all of you who have been, and all of you who might consider it, I look forward to when we're all back together in our nave again. Thanks be to God. Now, until we're able to, to join around the table of our Lord again, we pray that you're all well and you remain well. May the blessings of our Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you, in your home, and in your heart, this day 